Hello everybody, Darren here, and welcome to my quick review and breakdown of the Anno 1800 DLC Docklands. Docklands is the first DLC in the Season 3 pass for Anno 1800, but it is also available as a standalone purchase. Docklands essentially allows you to build a modular harbour where you can exchange goods with a merchant named Captain Tobias who visits every 20 minutes. The harbour also allows you to save on space with several modules dedicated to improving your harbour master's office, allowing you to stack more than three items within it, improving storage by giving you about four times the storage for the same space, and improving the loading and unloading speed of ships, effectively allowing you to save on piers. After you've exchanged several goods with Captain Tobias, you'll begin to specialize in those goods, allowing you to trade them for higher values. Doing this also grants you more modules, allowing you to further improve your efficiency and also allowing you to open up more trade contracts. Docklands also comes with 25 new ornaments, most of which are themed to fit within a pier or a key, such as lighthouses, bridges, barges and rowboats, and it also features a new song and some added achievements. So that's the summary of what's available in Docklands, now let's talk about how it actually plays. So Docklands works with existing campaigns as well as new ones. Once you reach 250 artisans, you'll be contacted by Captain Tobias and given the option to begin building your main wharf. The wharf building can only be built once per island and costs timber, bricks, steel and glass and 25,000 gold. Everything in Docklands is at the artisan level of construction, so you're never going to need concrete or power. The Docklands also doesn't use any workforce and it doesn't cost any influence to build or expand. Building the wharf is really easy, it might even be too easy. There are six module types, all of which are 3x3 three three in size, but some of which also require a 3x3 three three space for clear water in front of it. It's fairly generous with this though, as four modules can overlap on the clear water. You also don't even have to connect the modules to the main wharf if you don't want to, but doing so will give you an attractiveness bonus as each module provides 15 attraction. As part of the free update to the game, roads can now be extended into the ocean so you can connect to your docklands to get the attractiveness bonus, though you don't have to connect it if you don't want to. In terms of the building mechanics, because there's no restrictions at all, it feels quite simple, a bit bland to play around with. I pictured needing to at least make sure the water had access out to the ocean, but there really is no limits at all, and maybe for some that's a good thing, but I was hoping to have a little think about how things would be laid out. Instead, making it look nice can be a challenge in itself, using the new ornaments to create a lived-in feel to it. I'm really happy with how mine is actually turning out, and because it is so flexible, I'm sure you can design a beautiful looking dock lens, or if you're hyper-efficient, just stack it all into as small a place as possible. Visually, each module has some distinctions, such as a repair crane module, of course having a big repair crane on top of it, and the exports office having glass rooftops. Generally though, the Docklands don't have that much customization, but like engineer or investor households, they modularly fit together with L junctions and T junctions. Even the pier does this as well. Over time, your harbour will start to look very busy as small rowboats crowd the depots and loading wharfs. The ornaments are really quite nice, and there's a good variety of them for s from small restaurants to park benches and lampposts to full-on loaded barges that bob up and down on the water, or bridges to help connect various piers together. Unfortunately though, the bridges don't actually connect roads together as they are just a visual ornament. So that's pretty much all for the buildings and ornaments, but let's get to the gameplay. When first setting up your docklands, you'll have one available trade contract. Trades are where you exchange one good for another. Now you can never sell goods or buy them for money, but instead you must exchange them, and different goods have different exchange ratios. Now generally, the more complex a good is to make, the higher its value when traded. You can list any good you want for trade, except for oil, and you can receive any good that's offered up by the eight companies in the game. Now, these companies have a set list of goods, and they're themed after what they offer. For instance, Tattershire Farms offer agricultural and livestock goods, while Kinsa Mining offer up different types of ore and a handful of refined goods like steel or brass. Now, goods each have a color-coded specialty to them, common, uncommon, rare, and epic. Most common goods are available to trade for right at the beginning, but most other goods require you to have achieved either exporting or importing something, or in some cases they require you to have multiple active trades ongoing. So for instance, to be able to import gramophones, you need to have already imported 1,602 tons of pocket watches. Once you've got that done, it's unlocked forever at all of your main wharfs, even if they're in different regions. And from here, you can actually swap between all of your different docklands just to check your contracts. 
Anyways, the rarity of goods shows you their exchange ratio. Now, common is 1.0, uncommon is 1.2, rare is 1.4, and epic is 1.6. For the other companies, this means they're getting the better deal. As an example, 35 fish will get you one jewelry. Now, let's reverse it. If you were to offer up one jewelry, all things being equal, you'd expect to get 35 fish in return. But jewelry is listed as epic, meaning that they have a higher ratio. So for you, one ton of jewelry gets you 21 fish. But, just like the other companies, you can also increase the ratio of some of your goods, and it's based on volume. If you export a thousand of any good, it'll be listed as uncommon, giving you a 1.2 ratio. When you export 2,500 of that good, it moves up to rare, at 4,000 it goes to epic, and at 7,000 it becomes legendary, a specialty level that's not available for the other companies, which actually gives you a ratio of 2.0, meaning it's worth twice as much. As you can see though, you have to choose what goods you put in the slots, and this is shared across all of your docklands, so you can only ever get the benefits of specializing in 10 goods at a time. The other incentive to specialize is so that you can unlock more modules to use. More modules means bigger storage, faster loading, and importantly, more trade contracts. More trade contracts means you can list many goods at once, and overall export much higher volumes of goods for different things. You can list one good as much as you want for export or import. You cannot both import and export the same good at the same time in the same place. You can on different islands, so you could import soap in one place and export it in another. And this can be a really great way to actually gain high volume fast to kind of unlock those specialty bonuses. The highest requirements for high tier goods such as steam carriages require you to have 31 active trades at a given time. But the maximum you can ever have in one place is 12, so this means that you're going to have to build on multiple islands if you want to get the full access to everything. So that's basically it. Now, having played with it for a while, I'm really kind of nervous about it. I enjoy the DLC. I think the docks look cool. I love the ornaments. And generally, I really like the progression through the imports and exports. However, it seems like a balancing nightmare. For instance, I can offer up 100 cigars and get nearly 1,200 gold ore back. The cigar chain takes about 300 obreros to work, and you get cigars every 30 seconds. A gold mine takes 100 obreros to work and takes 150 seconds to get, so I'm not sure why you would ever use gold mines again instead of just trading for it. Another example of how I've been using it in my game is I trade champagne for beer. Two champagne buildings allowed me to remove four powered breweries, as well as all the malt, the wheat, and the hops that go along with it just seems really, really powerful to eliminate entire production chains like that. Now, I'm not a min-max guy. Maybe some people who build really big cities can't afford to trade champagne or something, but so far, it seems like you can now trade for and remove huge parts of your game's economy. And I guess I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I'm having fun figuring it out, and it feels good to optimize, but I kind of have this feeling like this just shouldn't be possible. It's a tough one. For sure, I'm going to be using it in my campaign to get extra coal for the Arctic and extra coffee. As long as I just overproduce something like steam carriages, just a little, then I can essentially purchase anything I want. There is one last thing. There's a new ship type in the game. It's called the World Class Reefer. The ship is basically a cargo ship, albeit a tiny bit slower and with more hit points. And it's twice the influence cost. But where it excels is in open water. Traveling between regions, it's about 50 to 60% faster than a cargo ship. Now, for the influence cost, personally, I'm not sure it's worth it. Though, if equipped with items, you could probably make it twice as fast as a standard cargo ship and replace two cargo ships with one great reefer. Though, the influence cost would just work out the same. So, not sure why you'd use it. It seems to me it would make a lot more sense if it costs something like four influence instead of six. Cargo ships cost three. Then you'd actually have a, a kind of a reason to use it in some circumstances. Now, how you get the ship is going to be a little bit spoilery, so skip ahead to the time on screen if you don't want to know. So once you get one of your trade goods to the top level of specialty, Captain Tobias will recount a story about a special shark named Deep Blue. After blowing a foghorn, she appears, but upon taking a picture of her, a newspaper publishes it and poaches are after her, so you must escort her back to open waters. Once complete, you get the blueprints to make your own world-class reefer as much as you want. It's a charming little unexpected addition. 
So that's really it for the Docklands DLC. I'm really actually having good fun with it. It's just that my criticisms are that building it seemed to be a bit too straightforward and that I just worry about the balance of the game as now you're just creating huge quantities of goods for effectively no cost. In fact, the Docklands makes you money because it adds big attractions. With something like Bright Harvest, that heavily optimized farms, there was an oil and workforce cost associated with it, and you had to figure out placements for fuel stations. But this is just a giant beneficial add-on with no drawbacks at all. I feel like it would have been reasonable to maybe have like 20 workers per module or something. That way, you'd be removing production chains, but some of the workforce are going to be needed to man those docks. So, I guess we'll see how the community beat and abuse it and try to break it. I hope in a way though it doesn't get heavily nerfed because now I'm setting up my economy based off of these numbers and if they start changing wildly the campaign's going to be kind of ruined so it's a very serious and delicate thing that they've started to mess with here. Anyways, that's going to be it for my review. Please consider checking out my other reviews for Anno 1800 and its DLCs. I've reviewed every DLC so far and also done a very helpful guide, which has actually grown to become the most viewed guide on YouTube. Consider as well liking this video if you want to see more Anno 1800 content from me and more reviews as they release. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Hey guys, thank you very much for watching, and remember, if you want to support this series directly, you can click the Join button to become a channel member. Doing so will get your name in the credits, as well as loyalty badges and emotes to use in the comments. If you don't see the Join button, it means the video has been copyright claimed, but you can still join from the channel page on desktop. You can also link your account to our Discord to get a special role on there that will give you access to the Senate House and a few other perks.